Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here as always with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Tony, I'm ready to watch some basketball, but more importantly, I'm here to talk about football. So we're going to talk, we're going to look at watch one later, but we're going to talk about one right now. Are you saying football is more important than basketball? I'm not placing a value judgment here. I'm just saying if we recorded a podcast about basketball right now, it would be outdated by the time most people were listening to it. So I think we're just being smart here. Oh, okay, correct. Yes. Uh, and this is actually the last of our spring positional previews. But today we are talking about the Ohio State offensive line, which uh, may be the worst in the nation. I'm <laughs> sorry. Maybe one of the best in the nation. Got to, got to check your sort order there on your uh, Excel spreadsheet. Correct. I went Z to A. I should have gone A to Z. I don't remember UMass being this good last year. Yes. That's crazy. Uh, but yes, yeah, so Ohio State slated to have a very good offensive line. But let's talk about what the what things will look like this spring and then go from there. Right now, there are some rumblings that Harry Miller may not be full go in, in the spring and may miss some time. We'll see if that's uh, if, if that's the case. Although we may not see it. Who knows what we're going to see this spring, Tom? <laughs> um, I have a... Yes or no, Tom? Do we get to see a practice in the horseshoe this spring? I'm going to be the eternal optimist and say yes. We will see something in the horseshoe before the spring game, and we will also see the spring game. Because, I mean, you got to remember last fall, we did get to watch at least a little bit of one practice inside the horseshoe, and that was last fall. So now, like, with things being a little further along and everyone being a little more comfortable with where things really stand, like, I think, I, I think. It would be pretty. It would be a pretty big surprise and a pretty big disappointment if we get to see uh, a few practices before the spring game. I agree. That's where I am. I, I think it'll be in, in the stadium. Who knows? It may maybe even practice field, but I doubt it. I just think uh, the stadium would be a good a good uh, compromise because, as we know, Ohio State football is all about compromising <laughs> with the Ohio State beat. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's let's make it happen, Jerry. Can't wait to see you, bud. <laughs> so if if Harry Miller isn't going this spring i know there's some talk of uh do you slide matt jones over and let him go and let him be in the center and uh to see if you know what maybe maybe you like him better than harry miller center you got to see harry miller as the number two center in various games last year you got to see him start against the michigan state uh spartans you saw, saw him in that game where he was uh very fired up early and then calmed down eventually and and was fine and so do you uh, – because I'm torn on this. I, I think uh, initially my thought was you keep Matt Jones at guard because you want him to be one of your starting guards, and then you let Luke Whipler, if, if you need snaps, you let your backup center get them to see how good he can be and just to get him some experience. But then the more you think about it, it's like, well, if Matt Jones is a, is, is a better center than Harry Miller, now would be about the only time to – find that out so where are you tom i think a lot of this kind of depends on where they think luke whippler is right now because you know if harry miller is your starting center this fall and luke whippler is his backup and they don't want to give matt jones a shot at center this spring i think that tells me that they are very comfortable with luke whippler being the center this fall i I think there's a lot of value in having matt jones get some more center reps this spring and he doesn't have to rep exclusively at center, but I think there's some value in having him rep at center just in case. I mean, you can have, you know, if Harry Miller is, you know, fully recovered and hundred percent going into the fall, like guys still do get hurt. And you know, that, that can happen. We have seen Ohio state offensive linemen go out with season ending injuries multiple times in the past few years. So you have to have someone else who is not just like, well, playable there like you have to have a okay we can win the national championship with this guy level center and that's something that matt jones i think based on what we saw from him and a little bit we saw last fall i think matt jones is a you can win the national championship with this guy level offensive lineman somewhere on that line and you know there are enough other options at guard that i think it's worth at least exploring him at center this spring because you have, you know, you put Dewan Jones and Paris Johnson and Matt Jones in the center of that that line. I think that's the center of a line that could win a national championship. And, you know, I, it, can Luke Whipler do that at center? 
I don't know. I have not seen any, I have not, not seen remotely enough of Luke Whipple to have any kind of, kind of an informed opinion on that. So, you know, if, if they don't put Matt Jones at center this spring, I think that tells me that they are extraordinarily high on Luke Whipple. But, you know, I, I think even then it might still make sense to have Matt Jones at least rep some there just to have another, another guy who, you know, can do it. Well, I'm reminded of the 2018 season, like late while, uh, Josh Myers was a redshirt freshman and talking to Greg Stadrawa saying, I don't want to move Matt Jones to center. And the reason being was because he liked, uh, gosh, he would have been Michael Jordan at that mm-hmm. point starting. And then, uh, and then uh, Josh Myers behind him and didn't think there would be a need to uh, get Matt Jones into that mix because he liked his top two guys. And so I think, I think the, the Whipler Luke Whipler situation is, is kind of similar to that where, um, we we really like him. We don't want to confuse that situation or create some doubt there by putting Matt Jones there. But um, you don't really have a proven center, and if Matt Jones could be that guy, that would be the only time to find out. However, I I don't know that we saw anything last year that would well. I don't know that we saw anything last year that would create doubt that Harry Miller can't do it. However, Harry Miller was probably the fourth best offensive lineman or fifth best offensive lineman last year. So that made him the worst, but calling him the worst offensive lineman is not really um, commensurate with his performance because I think he was still pretty good and, and certainly had his issues, but I don't know that that means he's not the best choice for center. And I don't know that, you know, Matt Jones started one game and, and played here and there and, and was very good. But uh, you know, I'm not sure that he played better than than Harry, Harry Miller throughout the course of a season. It's just it's interesting to me that because I, I think I think Matt Jones is a starter at guard, and I think you need to get him as much experience there as possible. But if there are concerns about who that backup center is, or or that you know maybe Luke Whipler is not there, then yeah, I guess you do have to get Matt Jones some time there. Well, yeah, if you do have concerns at backup guard, then then I think then he plays that Harry Miller role this year, potentially yeah. where you're the starting left guard or the starting right guard. And then you are also the backup center and you slide over and then they put another guard in there. If, if the starting center goes down and that's like, there's a lot of value in having five guys, six guys, seven guys who they feel like these are championship level players on the offensive line. And we have multiple different ways that they can sort of organize guys and, sort things out and, and, you know, Hey, if the left guard goes down, we've got a guy for that. If the right guard goes down, we've got a guy for that. Like if you have viable options that you're comfortable with at all five spots, like you're probably not going to need to go through 10 offensive linemen in a season. Like that would be a, that would be like, you know, spinal tap drummer kind of levels of injuries, but you, you're, you're probably going to need someone else. I mean, how, how many years have they gone through with just five guys playing completely healthy the whole year, not having to miss half a game, not having to, I mean, it's just like, there's, there's a lot of very big bodies there falling on top of each other and like stuff happens. I mean, Wyatt Davis had a really bad injury at the end of the national championship game, but you know, there were a bunch of times when Wyatt Davis went down earlier in the year that it was like, oh man, he might, he might be done for quite a, like laying on the field and very, you know, <laughs> in some serious distress. And uh, you know, you were like, oh man, this is, this, this does not look good you just, you have to be prepared for that. And so whatever they, whatever they have to do to have multiple guys who they feel comfortable with at all five of those spots, like wh- whatever that is, like, that's fine. Do it. I think it was, uh, I don't know how many years ago, four, three, four, five years ago, they had like all five guys made it through uninjured and, and started every game. And it was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. And you know, they did it. And that's just, you don't expect that to happen. And so you get a, as many guys prepared as possible. Tom, where does uh, where does Paris Johnson end up for you? Because for me, there's no room for him to tackle. I'm not one of these people who, uh, you know, Paris Johnson is the best tackle since, you know, the best prospect since Orlando Pay. So he needs to be at left tackle because Thayer Munford has done just fine there. So I'm, I have, I have Paris Johnson at left guard and then whatever you want to do with Matt Jones and Terry Miller between center and, and right guard or center and left guard, whatever. I've got Paris Johnson in this lineup as one of the top five. 
And uh, whether that's left guard or right guard, do, do you want him at left guard just to get used to the left side of the field at this point? You know, because he'll be left tackle in 2022. I don't see that as a bad thing. It's like, well, you're only going to let him start at, at tackle for one year before he goes pro. And it's like, well, if he's good enough to go pro after just one year of starting tackle as a junior, then consider that a pretty big, uh, a good junior year. And, and the, the progression continues, but there's no reason for him to play tackle right now, considering where Thayer Munford is. And I, I know, um, you know, people, people have talked about it, like switching, switching those two and moving Munford inside. I'm just, I, uh, I have seen enough of Thayer Munford to know that I really like him at left tackle. I have seen enough to, of Paris Johnson to know I'd probably prefer him on the interior, but you know, at this point he, he'll eventually be fine on the, on the outside. I don't think he'd be better than Thayer Munford like right now. Well, I think the biggest thing is they always talk about wanting to get their five best on the field. Yeah. Like that's, that's how you get your five best on the field. And, you know, there, I'm sure Thayer Munford, when he was deciding he was going to come back and talking to the coaches was not like, why don't you slide me inside? Like he's, he's coming back to have put another year of good film together at left tackle. And he played at a level where it wasn't like, yeah, this guy was okay last year. Like he was, uh, you know, you have all conference at the minimum, all conference level performers at both tackle spots. So I don't know that you need to like upset the apple cart there. Like just if you have two guys who are returning, that's fine. And then you find a spot for, for Paris Johnson. I do like the idea of putting him at left guard because then very natural, you're, you're sliding out one spot and you know, it, there are obviously different responsibilities and some different, different uh, things you've got to do. You, you got to be a little quicker outside and all that. But if you're doing things on the same side of the line, like he's going to be talking to Thayer Munford all year and that's going to get him about as prepared as he can be. So and, and, you know, if they are Munford goes down, then potentially you could move Paris Johnson outside if he's one of the, you know, if he's the next best tackle and you just slide him outside and he's playing left tackle at that point. But yeah, this is, you know, you, you want to develop guys, you want to make the most of things. And, you know, I, I'm sure there will be a little bit of uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth. If you only get one year of him at left tackle, like, you know, like they got one year out of Dwayne Haskins as a starter before he turned into a first round pick. I'm sure there'll be people who are upset about the, that, but it's like, you want to play him, you want to put, but the the biggest thing is you want to put this team in the best position to win. So the best position to win probably involves, Hey, just keep the all conference guys right where they are. Don't, don't mess with that. You saw from Paris Johnson and a little bit, you saw towards the end of the year, like he, he did as a true freshman against Clemson was just like, yeah, that was fine. Like that was, which is, which is huge. That's monster. That's like having a true freshman corner be out there. That's like, oh, if you look competent as a true freshman, that's like, all right, Big things are coming. So, you, you know, potentially it's an all-conference season for him as a left guard, and then you kick out the left tackle, and you, you're an all-conference or all-American at left tackle next year, and then, boom, you're in the NFL. Like, that's that would, you know, I'm sure people will look at that and go, well, they wasted him. And it's like, mm, if if they're winning games this fall and uh, it ends with him with being an all-American and a left, ta- you know, and, and a first-round draft pick, and, you know, they, they win the Big Ten again and they get to the playoff and maybe they make a run again this year at the national championship, like, I, I think that's probably a pretty good result. And you got a fourth year starter out of uh, Thayer Munford. Like this is his fourth year starting. And if they didn't have him, yeah, then Paris Johnson is probably your left tackle, but you're still getting, you'd still be getting plenty out of him as, as your left guard, which we know is a very still kind of a, an important position. And uh, for as fun as it would be to watch, you know, uh, Paris Johnson go one-on-one with defensive ends. It's also kind of fun to watch you know, guards pull and, <laughs> and 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 do stuff like that, and to to be able to watch him go in, you know, look for some linebackers, things like that. I, I'm sure there will be plenty to watch from him at guard. Let's talk about Dewan Jones, who I just see as a utility guy. As long as he wants that to be his role and is okay with it, I don't see him starting. I see him being able to start. Uh, as and start at guard, start at tackle. I, I just think an offensive line is a lot better when it has a sixth man who can do whatever. And, and I keep going back to the Brandon Bowen example, where you know, I, I think Bowen started at uh, maybe every position uh, except for maybe left guard and center mm-hmm. uh, as a Buckeye or left tackle and center rather. And so, I, and that's what Dewan Jones can do, and he can also play left tackle and, and just wherever you need him at. Somebody gets rolled. I, I got to come out, and then you know, like if it's Matt Jones at right guard, and he gets rolled. Dwan Jones could go in seven plays later. 
if Thayer Munford gets rolled and if they want to slide Paris Johnson outside or if they don't, they just want to keep Paris Johnson inside, you could throw Dewan Jones out there. And I wouldn't be surprised if there, there are games where Dewan Jones, you know, gets 30 or 40 snaps because he gets some early snaps and then he gets the late snaps in the second half. And it's like he's going to be very experienced. I know this is his junior year coming up. And sure, yeah, it probably would be great. You know, it'd be maybe it's frustrating to wait until your fourth year to be a starter. But that's pretty common on the offensive line. Um, and, and the fact that you didn't Richard as a freshman maybe makes this time frame even longer, but you get to play as a freshman. Consider yourself fortunate. You played a lot as a sophomore. You're going to play more as a junior. And then uh, if if there's a spot where you can start at, 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 as a senior, you assume there would be, but like, you also have to be better than the guys that you're competing against. And, and being the sixth man of this offensive line is not some sort of gosh, you know, especially for as lofty as he was not as a recruit. Yeah. And, and I mean, you got to remember after this year, their Munford's gone. Nick Petit Frere could be gone. Matt Jones could be gone. Harry Miller could be gone. I mean, you, you could be looking at a almost entirely new offensive line for 2022 at that point. Like Juan Jones might be the starting left tackle or starting right tackle on this team. But yeah, he, he is, he is a very useful piece for them this year because he is someone who I think they would probably feel comfortable playing in, most spots on that line if they needed him I, you know he he did not go to the national championship game because of uh covet issue but I, i'd be interested to see where he was on the depth chart in that game when you know they had to move some guys around and um you know he's but he seems like someone that they're comfortable with that they could put him in a bunch of different spots and that has tremendous value that's you know th- there are guys who cap out at that in their careers with you know like a josh Allaby who just kind of like, you know, when they needed him to make a start, a tackle, okay, just throw him in a tackle for, you know, uh, it'll just be the Rose Bowl. It's fine. Just go be the starting tackle for the Rose Bowl. And then you went back to being a backup. That's that's where his career kind of capped out. For Dewan Jones to be at that level already, potentially going into his third year, there's still there's still a lot of room for growth there. And, and uh, you know, he's someone who, that I think he's someone who, People look at him and he's, he's, you know, he's big and he's fun and he's, you know, he's got a lot of personality and everyone likes him. And I think people look at him as like, hey, he's the big fun guy. And wow, he's so big. And he's someone who, you know, if he did leave uh, or wasn't available or, you know, got hurt or transferred or whatever, wasn't available. He's someone they would really miss because that piece where, you know, even if you're not the starter, you're the sixth, seventh guy on that line. That's something you need. That is a break glass in case of emergency thing that like, that's fine. But if you, you know, you break glass and you, you know, you open up the fire extinguisher and it's like, I owe you one fire extinguisher. Like that's a problem when you need it, you need it. And, you know, having him there is a very big thing for this team this year. So they need, you know, I I think he, I think he will have a role this fall and it's just a matter of, you know, if everyone stays healthy, that's, that's a smaller role. And if a guy or two gets hurt, then that can potentially turn into a starting role pretty quickly. Just his ability to play wherever you want him to, again, aside from center, not that they wouldn't need him to because you've got other guys for that, but you can do whatever you want. Whereas if he's in the starting lineup, now you've kind of got to have a replacement tackle and a replacement guard. Um, or though I, you know, you could probably just move him around, I suppose, but he's, he's always going to be able to do those other things. And if he really embraces that, then you're looking at as, you know, the starting right tackle next year with so much experience. And then, you know, certainly the NFL draft looking at you. And then, I mean, Max Ray is your number four. Let's, or number five, or who, who even knows where he is? But we do know when he played last year, like his first legitimate playing time in his career as a fourth year guy, the third or fourth year guy last year, maybe a third year guy, um, 2017 maybe, so fourth year, he played well. And, and that's just another guy that is there for you. and. Uh, then you then you get into the freshman. So there's there's a lot of depth there, and that's why uh, another reason I don't think you need to be doing anything funny with Thayer Munford, who Tom is arguably Ohio State's best left tackle since Orlando Pace. Also, Tom, real quick, uh, Orlando Pace's son yeah. just committed to Ohio State as a preferred walk on. He's a six foot three, two hundred ten pound tight end slash linebacker, <laughs> and. Uh, so uh, it doesn't really make me feel old anymore. Like the Antoine Winfield Jr., that's like you know, 
maybe when it really started to hit, but I am completely calloused to all of these sons of the players I went to college with. Yeah, that's. Uh, does this mean I get to ignore your uh, spicy take about Thayer Munford or? No, 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 no. We can we okay. can start talking because I I've, I can I can give you the all of the starters. I've got them all here, and um, I there is I think the one the one argument would maybe be Taylor Decker, um, you know, Jamarco Jones, Jack Muhort, uh, like I said, Taylor Decker. I'm just running through the list of the most recent. Mike Adams, no. I'm Jim Cordell, no. All respect to Jim Cordell. Alex Boone, no. Um, you know, no. Boone keeps starting. Doug Daddish, no. Rob Sims, no. Although, please don't let Rob Sims' mom hear that. Uh, you know, Tyson Walter, of course not. Uh, please don't let Tyson Walter hear that. Uh, you know, Henry Fleming, Adrian Clark. It, it, it you can. Look all you want. It's the argument for me is uh, he's certainly, arguably the best since Orlando Pace. Now there's quite a gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's understand that. But is he markedly better than Taylor Decker, or is is Taylor Decker markedly better than him? Is Jamarco Jones? I, and, and this year, I think he's going to be better than he was last year. Yeah, I think I think right now he has the possibility of being the best left tackle since Orlando Pace. I don't think he's there yet. I mean, Taylor Decker, you got to remember, Taylor Decker was the 16th overall pick in the yeah. NFL draft. Like, and, and Munford's not there yet. If Munford was there, Munford would already be in the NFL draft. Like, <laughs> that's, you would not, he would not have another year to build on his resume. Uh, to be a four-year starter, that's pretty impressive. And he's been like consistently like very good. He's not someone who, at the beginning of his career, I think people looked at and went, oh, this guy is a huge liability. Like, he's been like fine from day one. And has gone from fine to good to very good. And then, you know, if he takes another step this year and can build on his, his 2020, like then, he, then he could be, you know, if he, if he's an all American and that is not out of the realm of possibility for really either of those tackles, then, you know, then, then I think you probably are making that statement and you might even take out arguably at that point, but you know, right now, arguably is arguably is okay. Cause you can, you can argue lots of stuff. Yes. Um, I, I don't think he's there yet, but I think that's well within range by the end of this season. Which leads me to my next statement, Tom. Oh, blasphemy. Which is that <laughs> this year, uh, Thayer Munford and Nicholas Petit Ferrer will be Ohio State's best tackle duo since Corey Stringer and Orlando Pace. Remember how we talked about the fact that we don't comp people to Orlando Pace on the show? I mean, I'm this... not. <laughs> I'm just saying it'll be the best pair of tackles mm -hmm. since 1994 with Orlando Pace and Corey Stringer. Like, I'm looking at that, and that is just making me deeply uncomfortable on so many levels. And yet, it's not, I'm not thinking back and going, well, yes, what about, haha, -ha, what about this year? Uh -huh. like, yeah, like I, can, I, mean, I can tell you 1996, Orlando Pace and Eric Golston, they started for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, Tyson Walter and Brooks Burris, perhaps, Tom? <laughs> perhaps, Tyson perhaps Walter not. and Henry Fleming, uh, Adrian Clark and Henry Fleming, Tyson Walter and Shane Olivier, Ivan Douglas, Shane Olivier, Rob Sims and Shane Olivier. Stop me if any of these uh, trigger you. Uh, Rob Sims and Kirk Barton. Oop. Kirk Barton and Kirk Barton and Doug Daddish, mm -hmm. Kirk Barton and Alex Boone. Uh, I mean, Alex Boone and, was Alex Boone. No, Alex Boone was never an All American, right? I, I don't, don't believe so. No. Yeah, uh, Alex Boone and Bryant Browning. Bryant Browning. Uh, yeah, I mean, he probably should have been a guard, but they only had so many. We know under Jim Trestle, they only had so many offensive linemen. Jim Cordell and JB Shugarts. Ah, Mike Adams and JB Shugarts. Two years uh, starting together. Now, here's uh, 2012 is Jack Muhor and Reed Fragle, but it's 2013 where it's Jack Muhor at left tackle and Taylor Decker at right tackle, which is a good one. It's a good one, but it wasn't a good one back then. Like, yeah. those are two names that ended up being really good ones, 
But I mean, 2013 Taylor Decker was the year that everyone was at the Buffalo game going, this guy's <laughs> terrible. He's getting killed by a Mac player. What is going on? And then, you know, and then Khalil Mack turned into Khalil Mack. And then, uh, you know, the, there was a little more context there, but he was, you know, that was, that was far from the finished product of Taylor Decker in 2013. 2014 Taylor Decker, Daryl, Daryl Baldwin, which is really, really, really solid, mm-hmm. but you can't put a former defensive lineman as one of your, you know, as half of your best tandem ever. And then of course, 2015, you'd say the same thing because the right tackle at that point was Chase Ferris. And then 2016, it's Jamarco and Isaiah Prince. Uh, same thing in 2017. I don't know who started in 2018, 2019, and 2020 because the high state record books have not been updated. Uh, <laughs> feels, feels like we should remember this, but uh, yeah, well, it's a long time ago. doesn't matter. Yeah. No. Yeah, no, I, the, the, none of the tackle pairings the last three years have been so overwhelming that I'd, I'd put them up in that in that hallowed territory. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I guess you I mean, they, they've got to be up there. Because, I mean, Barton was an All-American and, you know, you had a pretty good guy on the other side of the field there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is I think this is. I'm, I'm going to say possibly to probably that's true, which is crazy because I read this and I had this like visceral reaction, like, come on, come on. But yeah, like maybe. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, I think it's, it's uh, very, very possible. In fact, uh, if it doesn't happen, uh, consider, consider disappointment and maybe label the players chokers. Busts, please. Busts. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's right. That's uh, so. I I think the possibility is is very high there, and uh, if the, the trajectory continues, then that's what will happen. So let's talk about the depth at guard, where you lose Wyatt Davis, you don't know where Harry Miller is going to be, you don't know where Matt Jones is going to be. One of those guys will be there, and so that helps. Paris Johnson, you assume, will be at one of the guards. You've got Enoch Vamahi. You assume he's back to guard from uh, his little stint at defensive tackle against Alabama. Jacob James, my understanding, is working at center, but who knows where that goes? If uh, maybe, well, I guess I guess he would say like the number three, regardless of what happens with, between Matt Jones and Harry Miller. Ryan Jacoby now in his third season, still looking for his first action. Uh, just scrolling through here, and then you've got a bunch of tackles in like Josh Fryer and uh and Trey LaRue and Grant Toutant to see where they end up. But it's there's a lot of unproven guys, but there's still like I think Enoch Vamahi is maybe in that next level behind the starters where uh he's kind of picking up and uh because the they even played him. They they played him a little bit as a true freshman. He's still redshirted, and they, then he played again a little bit last year. So it makes you think like he is is on his way to being part of the the two deep at guard. But I think uh, you know I think they're fine with. I really like the potential of Paris Johnson and and whoever else. And then you just wonder about the how deep they are behind him. Yeah, and and the depth I think is something that may sort of take care of itself just because of the depth of the depth. Yeah. Where, you know, I think we're probably both pretty comfortable with, you know, you're going to have a good starting two and you're probably going to have a good guy or two behind that. And, you know, for Enoch Vamahi to have played a decent amount two years ago, again, he redshirted, so he only played four games. But as a true freshman, he was out there and it didn't look like way out of place. So two more years of experience, like that's that's probably going to be a player that would start for virtually every Big Ten play, team. and you know, he certainly will be in the, you know, in the competition for those starting jobs, but that's, that, that's quality depth that teams just like don't have. Like no, normally you get through the first five offensive linemen and it's like, after that, it's like, Ooh, boy, um, this guy has one leg. Uh, this guy uh, actually uh, came here to play soccer. Uh, this, and it's like, Eesh. yeah, I mean, you, you just, the, to have that depth is crazy. Now, you know, there, there's always, when you have talented players buried on the depth chart, there's always the transfer portal question, which, you know, I mean, that, that, that's just going to kind of be part of life now that, that you just sort of ask those questions, but you know, they have so many good players there on that depth chart on the interior of the defensive line that it's like, it'll, it'll be fine. Like 
I don't know exactly how that too deep is going to shake out, but I, I am extremely confident that barring an absolute massive tidal wave of transfers, I will come out. They will come out of spring practice with me going, yeah, they've got a very solid two deep at, at probably all three of those interior spots. Yeah. And even if they do get some transfers, I don't know how much it would affect the two deep because the, the guys who are going to be transferring are going to be the guys who have not yet reached that two deep or who, who are looking up at, at it or guys who get passed by, say, Donovan Jackson coming in as a true freshman, mm-hmm. Ben Christman coming in as a true freshman, Zen Mahalski at tackle. I think we, you know, the thought is maybe he takes a little bit longer to develop just because of his rate of uh, development, putting a whole bunch of weight on last year and kind of being this late bloomer. Um, but I, I think you've got a couple of decent guards who, in uh, Chrisman and Jackson, the two incoming guys, who are um, – Chrisman is here now, and Jackson will arrive this summer. Is that correct, Tom? Correct. Yeah. And so that, that makes it a little bit l- – more difficult for Jackson to get in there. But I, I see both of those guys as also being a utility guy who could, you need me a right tackle. I can play right tackle. Uh, you need me a guard. Of course, that's, I, I can do that as well. So I think I like that, that versatility, although you got to be careful, Tom, to, you got to stay, you, you can't get too close to the Jim Bowman, Jim Trestle <laughs> model of everybody needs to play three positions and it's okay to, specialize a tackle like you mm-hmm. you don't have to be a like not everybody can be jack muhort and play every spot extremely well uh, it, it's okay to have you know, orlando pace is probably a terrible center i'm just, not on the court <laughs> basketball is all state but i'm just saying probably couldn't snap the ball don't tell him i said that i i would i would never i i never not not in a million years uh no it, i think they they have enough guys at all those spots that you probably don't need a ton of cross training, you know, where, where if, if you have seven guys on your roster that are people, they, they're comfortable, they can play at the level they need them to, to win a championship. Like that's when you get into the cross in, in the need to cross train. And the fact that they probably are, you know, I don't know exactly how many they'd be comfortable with. And if you ask them, I don't think they would necessarily tell you right now, but you know, if you have seven and one of them can do that, that's like, okay, you can kind of feel good about where things stand. As you have more depth there, you have more options there. Like that just gets, you know, that just gets better. And you might be, a, you might be the best option at two or three different spots. So that's, I think that may be where Dewan Jones may find himself. He may be the next best option at a few different spots on that line. But, you know, some of the younger guys coming in this year, the nice thing is for Donovan Jackson, for Ben Chrisman, there's not going to be that immediate like okay well you you got to get you got to get good right now because because you're gonna, they're going to need you like hurry up they can they can take a year develop get the tech refine the technique all that stuff get comfortable and then you know maybe next spring you're competing for one of the starting guard spots or or uh you know one of the starting tackle spots or you know whatever it is whatever wherever they end up slotting in the fact that if you don't have to rush guys out there, that is always a good thing. You know, if they earn it, like if they, if they come in and are just like blowing people away, like, great, that is a wonderful problem to have. You just, you don't want to be in that spot where it's like, well, no one's ready. So we're just going to have to throw someone in and cross our fingers like that. You don't, you don't want to be in that spot. And with the depth they've accumulated they're they're not going to be in that spot this year, which is remarkable when you consider how thin they were at a whole bunch of these spots like three years ago. I think it's also good to have, uh, like to see an opportunity in front of you and where uh, for next year, like say Donovan Jackson as a guard coming in as a five-star guy wants to play right now, he's going to be able to watch, but then he'll see like Paris Johnson move to left tackle. Oh, there's an opening. And I, I think it's good for these young guys to see openings and to see opportunities rather than, like to be if you're starting like five sophomores then the guy the incoming guy is like i have i have no chance of starting there's no urgency so i think and having uh just cycling through offensive linemen it creates a sense of urgency and the guys in the, in the too deep that next year there's there's a spot right now for me to earn a starting spot and that creates better development rather than well in year three, there's going to be an opportunity, so I can just I can chill for a year or so, and and 
right now, as long as you've got this uneven balance of you're losing two guys this year, two guys next year, like is that as long as that is a constant, and there's always an open spot the following year. I think that breeds um, just the right kind of hunger. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to have a little bit of hope there because you know I think there there are plenty of times when being a football player is not that super fun. You know, you, you watch the Matt Drills videos, it's like mm, I bet they want to feel like they're doing this for a reason and not just. <laughs> Not just to have Mickey Marotti yell at them at six in the morning a whole bunch like that. That that's the kind of thing where, you know, I think everyone works better under a deadline, or a lot of people work better under a deadline. Where, you know, if you don't have a work project coming up, like eh, knock off at three o'clock on a Friday, and that's fine. If you're looking at like, hey, there's a big presentation coming up or whatever, like you're gonna you're gonna stick and and put the work in, and make sure you get it done right. I think that's probably going to be true for for uh you know football players as well where you know do, do you want to put in a little extra film study well if you feel like you have a legit chance at competing for a job now or a year from now like you're going to sit there and you're going to put in that work because you're th- you know that's something that you have you have a tangible goal in the relatively short ish term and you think that could pay off so you're going to put that work in and you know that makes the whole team better if you if that's you know if if the backups are doing putting in that work and the younger guys are putting in that work. Everyone, you know, that pushes other guys to do the same work and make sure they're they're you know keeping up to speed as well. So that that's one of those things that you know the, the culture in that building is is very very strong, I think, and that's something we hear about a lot from them. And that's one of those things that helps fuel that culture. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a very good uh, year, but uh, more importantly, not more importantly, also a very good spring. Um, there there will be uh, some mixing and some matching and. So figuring out and you're still trying to find out who your best five are. I, I think we're pretty uh, unanimous that the best five is Thayer Munford, Paris Johnson, Harry Miller, Matt Jones, and Nick Petit Frere, whichever you know order you want to put them in in terms of the interior. I think that that's your best five. And their number six is better than most teams' number six, and that's always a good spot to be in as well. So, Tom, anything else uh, on the offensive line before we get out of here? I think that's it. Can't wait to uh, hopefully get a chance to actually see some of this happen in person at some point later this month. Wouldn't that be lovely? It would be lovely. I, uh, we, we on this show are optimists, even though, again, not in terms of number of games played this season. Where Tom <laughs> is a, he, he's a, a, a twelve guy. He's he's holding at twelve games. I am of the opinion that Ohio State will play fifteen games this year. I'm actually down to 11. I think Oregon's wow. tra- I think Oregon's train is going to get waylaid somewhere between Oregon and Ohio. That's too long of a trip to take on a steamer train. So I'm in, I'm down to 11 games now. Wow, Oregon, DNP dysentery, <laughs> reverse <laughs> Oregon Trail. <laughs> That's too bad. Uh, 11 games. All right. Well, we'll see. Um, maybe maybe we average them together. I don't know what 15 and 11 average out to, uh, hmm. but I will know by the next show. So, uh, hey, everybody, check out BuckeyeScoop.com. If you are not yet a member, just try it. Just give it a try. If you don't like it, you can tell me about it. I will listen to you. I will listen. I'm, I'm a listener. Um, and if you do like it, tell me about that as well. I, I will listen to you. I will be just as uh, endearing and patient with you as if I were, uh, as if you were angry with me and, uh, and an unhappy customer. Eventually, I would uh, have to shut down that unhappy customer, though, because I eventually I got to go. And so uh, much like right now, we have to go. So thank you all for listening. And again, become a member if you're not. If you are a member, thank you. I, if we haven't thanked you enough, Tom, should we thank the people? I think I think we could thank them. Thank you for being a uh, thank you for supporting us at BuckeyeScoop.com. Hope you're enjoying your uh, experience. That Ask the Insiders board is a lot of fun. A lot of fun conversations there. And uh, I keep, you know, every time. Every time we put out something on Twitter, it's like, hey, you should become a member. There's you always get a bunch of members going, quote tweeting it like, you should do it. It's the most incredible thing. It's like, All right, look, we're not just it's not just us saying it. It's it's people who are, you know, we're we're not paying them to say that. They're paying us to say that. That's that's how good it is. So <laughs> I I, it, I do sometimes maybe we forget to thank everybody who has <laughs> who who has uh, joined and, and contributes and uh, takes part. And uh, go ahead, Tom. You had something else. I, I was also going to thank the listeners because. Uh, just, just just listening to this podcast we appreciate that too yeah uh, they listen to it for free <laughs> anybody can do it. literally it takes no effort other than downloading and listening after we after we hit, hit stop i'll explain how ads work <laughs> uh all right you can do that 
And then, uh, yeah, I look forward to that talk, Tom. Thank you all for listening. Hey, uh, look forward to uh, the morning scoop tomorrow. Mm-hmm. It's going to be morning scoop tomorrow. Will be Tony Gerdeman and I. Instead of talking football, we're going to talk a little basketball. Because by the time uh, the morning scoop for Friday rolls around, Ohio State will have played its first and, you know, theoretically not only game of the Big Ten tournament. So that'll be uh, we'll get to break down what Tony got to see in person at uh, lovely whatever the thing is in Indianapolis. Is it Lucas Oil? It's still Lucas yes. Oil, right? Yes. So yes. at lovely Lucas Oil Field in uh, Indianapolis. And uh, so we'll talk a little, talk a little shooty hoops and uh, where they stand heading into the weekend and uh, what it might mean for the NCAA tournament. At the time I have Ohio State playing 15 postseason games. Mm, that seems high, unless they're going to win both the NCAA and NIT, which I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying. Boy, you are a hater, <laughs> but let's go. Uh, on that note, no, Tom, you're done. I know you want to say something more, but I can't, I can't have you uh, disturbing the listeners with your hate speech. So thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you guys next week.